Uh, we'll move on to the second talk. This is a full paper, um, Flexibility Disaggregation Under Forecast Conditions. And I believe Dominic will be presenting. Is that right, Dominic? So Dominic, while you share your screen, I'll just introduce you. <clears throat> Dominic Denner uh, received a BSc and MSc degree in Computer Science from University of Passau in 2014 and 2017, respectively. Today, he is doing his PhD at the Chair of Computer Networks and Computer Communications, where he is working on various energy-related research projects. His research interests include future energy systems, distributed smart grid algorithms, and fair control mechanisms for distributed storage and electric vehicles. So please go ahead. Thank you. So I guess you see my screen. <clears throat> I will present the paper flexibility disaggregation and forecast conditions. Uh, my co-authors are uh, Jan Seidemann, Michael Lechel, and Hermann de Meer, the latest two are also here today in the conference. So households can be seen traditionally as uh, consumers. So they're just uh, following kind of uh, standard load profiles. And with a more and more installation of PV systems and also mainly energy storage systems that are typically used to store surplus PV power from the PV systems for later use. And we also have an increase of more additional high loads that have a certain flexibility in the usage. <clears throat> We actually require a certain uh, manager or some uh, uh, entity that is creating a schedules for that. That is called an energy management system, uh, sometimes also called home energy management system. Uh, for the talk, we will here call it energy management system. And uh, the task of this energy management system is basically to calculate schedules for the electric vehicle, for the energy storage system uh, to kind of yeah, use the devices in the best optimal way for the household owner. So if you have now uh, plenty of that uh, energy management systems or households, uh, we can kind of utilize the flexibility that comes from the certain assets for power grid uh, operation purposes, for example. However, we are not likely to be allowed to control the devices directly because of privacy reasons. We might not want to reveal the information when my EV is at home or uh, some information about my energy uh, storage system, respectively my uh, specific load profile. The paper contributes with uh, three main parts. First of all, we do a forecast or discuss forecasting techniques for the local PV generation and household load. Uh, among them, we talk about long short memory neural networks. Second, uh, we discuss how to optimize the local energy management system, so the local operation of all the flexible assets there. Here we use a mixed integer linear problem. And finally, we are interested in how can we pool this flexibility or aggregate that flexibility to a flexibility pool in order to provide a uh, yeah, bigger amount of flexibility uh, based on distributed set of energy management systems. Here, uh, we will use a heuristic algorithm that uh, can be configured with some objectives. Uh, for example, that we kind of optimize uh, the disaggregation of a flexibility request based on the cost. Uh, that occurs at the energy management systems or based on the probability. And that is actually exactly the main goal of the paper to show how forecast impacts flexibility at disaggregation. <clears throat> Regarding forecast, we actually need to forecast both uh, PV generation and household load. Uh, we actually need to forecast it separately uh, to kind of be able to build the mixed industry linear problem later on. The PV forecast is based on a long short term memory current neural network where we have uh, on our input layer seven input neurons that cover input data from uh, soul cost uh, over a time horizon of two and a half years. Uh, the input data is basically weather data, so we have global horizontal irradiance, temperature, uh, solar zenith angles, and so on. The hidden layer consists of 25 uh, LSTM blocks. Uh, that finally can capture uh, long and short term memory or information dependencies from the data and kind of uh, train information out of the data. The output layer consists of signal neuron, which gives us the PV output power in watt that we can finally use for the local optimization. The household load uh, is a much simpler model. So it's just for demonstration purposes here. It's a statistical model uh, that we call similar day. And uh, it does kind of a very simple work. It just takes the average of the last uh, four weeks of the same day. So if I want to predict the Monday, I will take the last five, uh, four Mondays, take the same hour, build an average, and that is my predicted profile, so to say. The interesting aspect is actually how this forecast uh, 
impacts the local optimization and the flexibility pooling or flexibility disaggregation. And therefore, we built a probability density function for the error of the forecast. And actually, not for each error itself, but of the combined generation and load forecast error. And from that, we can then create a cumulative distribution function where we can see, for example, the right hand uh, picture uh, that during the noon time, we see that the error is uh, much uh, less dense. Whereas during the night, uh, we can have kind of a very small error with high probabilities. Having uh, these profiles, predictive profiles for PV and household, we can start to model our mixed digital linear problem. We have here on the right hand side the uh, household load and the PV generation. Here denoted as a negative load. And we define decision variables and constraints for all our assets. Uh, so the time horizon is discretized, for example, in quarter of hour slots, and we define one decision variable for each time slot. So for example, for the EV charging, we might uh, need to add constraints for the availability of the EV so that we only can charge the EV when it's available uh, at the household. We might need to have a uh, requirement or a constraint for the energy that needs to be charged, so the surface below the charging profile. And we might have some additional constraints from the uh, charging facility, so some upper uh, charging uh, limit, power limit, or a minimum charging limit, which is typically for type 2 connectors with PDWM uh, uh, control signals, where you kind of need to charge an EV with at least 6 ampere per phase, otherwise it will not start. The second asset is the energy storage system. It is quite similar to the EV itself, uh, with the difference that it's possible to charge it bidirectionally, so we can charge it and discharge it. Uh, we also need to model efficiency uh, values in these uh, constraints, and um, we need to ensure that we cannot discharge an empty battery or charge a full battery that can be all expressed by constraints in the problem combination. Summing up the profiles, we get our energy grid profile, uh, so basically the profile that we can expect to measure at the grid connection point. And we might also want to have here some additional constraints on the system, uh, for example, some peak limitations, uh, some grid limitations that are uh, pre-known, or it might also be required based on political decisions uh, that we are not allowed to use our energy storage system, for example, for grid, uh, uh, for playing on the grid uh, price, uh, on the market price, so that we are only allowed to use the storage for local surplus power, and we are not allowed to discharge the battery to the grid that can all be modeled with such contract constraints. The optimization itself uh, is then uh, operated in a hierarchical manner. So we define four objective functions, where we first optimize for the first objective function from the remaining solution space. We select the best or the optimum from the next objective function and so on. The first objective is to optimize for price. So basically to reduce uh, the money that we need to pay for buying energy from the grid. Uh, weighted by the energy cost. And uh, it also considers the amount of stored energy that we have in the, our energy storage system and the amount that we finally uh, put it into our, or charged into our EV. That indirectly uh, optimizes for self consumption water key. The second objective is to do block charging for electric vehicle. So that is mainly important if we have uh, multiple EVs. Uh, because we do not want to have constant switching between the EVs, because uh, the MIP doesn't really uh, care which EV is charging. So we need to manually kind of uh, optimize for that so that we can get, get uh, sequential charging of the EVs in blocks. The third objective is to do beach peak shaving. So that's not only optimal or good for the power grid operator, but also kind of interesting for the owner of the house and uh, the operator of the energy management system. Because the far I'm away from my peak limitation of the grid connection point, the bigger or the better I can tolerate forecast errors because I'm still away from the boundary of the uh, solution space. And the last objective is to optimize for EMS flexibility. That means actually to be able to operate my energy storage system in the future in a sort of an optimal way uh, to have kind of yeah, the safety margin to be able to, to increase or decrease the charging power of the system, as well as I need to ensure that I have enough uh, capacity stored in my battery. <clears throat> we have conducted a uh, yeah, evaluation, performance evaluation of this MILP 
on a realistic set of 350 energy management system that come from five real PV systems, 10 real household data, uh, where we took seven days in total, which sums up to 350 energy management systems. The data of all that is available in Open Energy Platform uh, since yesterday. And for each of these EMS scenarios, we added uh, a random number between zero and two charging processes um, that we extracted from a mobility survey from which we get the arrival time at home, the departure time from home, and the required energy, which is equal to the required energy from the last trip. So we assume that we want to simply recharge our uh, EV to 100% so that we can capture any upcoming new trip. The simulation is done on a single server CPU with Google V version 9.1. So that is kind of something that we can expect to have at the edge nodes. And from the computational performance, we see that objective one is very fast. So it's uh, solved in a few hundred milliseconds. And in order to get the whole grid connected profile, uh, we need to solve all four objectives, obviously. And that takes an average yeah, still a bit more than two seconds, which is uh, kind of reasonable. To see the impact of uh, the forecast on the decision of the MIP, we will have a look at autokey, which is the ratio of PV generation from total consumption and self-consumption, which is the ratio of consumption covered by energy from PV generation. And we always compare the uh, scenario with a perfect forecast so that we have ideal knowledge about the future day, the next day, and with using LSTM RNN for the PV generation and a similar day model for the household load. The first thing that we see is that even with perfect forecast, it's not possible to get an optimal value or a maximum value in both uh, metrics because simply uh, the misalignment uh, of the PV uh, of the generation and the load demand and uh, also the battery storage system in some cases is a little bit too small. What we also see that with the forecast, there is a you know, definitely a small step back in the metrics. So we have a kind of reduction of the performance. And we see that the uh, outliers are increasing a lot. So we have some uh, kind of additional uh, yeah, outer boundaries where the forecast is really, really bad. Now, if we want to kind of utilize the flexibility from our outer perspective, we need to see, okay, what is the flexibility in our scenario? Flexibility here is the deviation from the planned grid profile. So that means I can here take my grid profile, I can drag around that line within the gray area, which is my solution space uh, of the MIP. And uh, for the definition of flexibility here, we neglect uh, ramp rate uh, limitations because battery storage system and EVs are typically convert to hardware and they react very fast in a few seconds. And the optimization is done in a quarter of an hour, so that is not a big deal. When we, for example, want to get a flexibility of 105 kilowatt at the time between 12 and 1 o'clock, we can add a new constraint to the MIP that specifies to have exactly that profile or that group profile at that time. And what we see is that this specific example uses the energy storage system to compensate the uh, flexibility request. And we see a small uh, energy rebound from the battery because uh, using that flexibility, and we see that the battery is used from zero to 100%, it requires to have some slight changes. And that is done basically from the optimization. So we see here the peak shaving uh, objective uh, trips in and is producing a quite flat rebound effect. We can calculate two metrics for such flexibility assignment. First of all, we can do cost calculation of that one, uh, which is very simple, the uh, difference of the objective of, of, uh, of objective one. So we take the objective before and we want to take the objective after applying that flexibility and we see how much cost occurs for the end user. So in that specific example, there is nearly none cost, uh, assuming that we have a constant feed-in uh, tariff uh, because we're just utilizing our battery in a different way, but at the end, it doesn't really make a difference. The second metric that we can calculate is the probability for flexibility delivery. And here that follows the idea that the nearer I'm to my outer range of the flexibility that I can provide, the uh, less likely it is that I still can provide it with a certain forecast error. And the more safety margin I have to my outer boundary, the higher uh, is the likelihood that I can compensate forecast errors with my local um, assets. 
And there, we use the commutative distribution function for the difference of the grid limit and the grid flexibility. <clears throat> so that's how flexibility is considered for each single energy management system. And the next thing is how can we aggregate this flexibility to a certain flexibility pool? For that, we assume that the energy management systems together need to fulfill linearly exactly the same like the flexibility request is done. So we neglect uh, the grid losses here. Um, and we can use different uh, assignment policies for the flexibility. Uh, for example, you can assign flexibility requests in an equal manner, meaning an absolute equal portion of the flexibility is given to each energy management system that participates in the pool. Contrary, a proportional one would kind of calculate the proportion uh, of the flexibility so that everyone is proportionally to its maximum capability of flexibility at a certain time, uh, providing to the flexibility request of the pool. The two more interesting uh, policies are for cost minimization. So they try to assign the flexibility to the energy management systems to get a minimum cost. And we try to also assign in a different policy the flexibility to the energy management systems to get a high probability for delivery. The uh, disaggregation uh, heuristic is rather simple. So we have, for example, here a request profile to a certain pool. And what you do is we slice the request in power to some small portions, and we assign each portion to the next energy management system that fulfills a certain metric. And the metric is kind of implementing the policy that we want to achieve. Uh, the assignment is done on a, a timely manner. So we start with the first time slot, assign the full capacity to the single energy management systems, and then iterate over to the next time slot where we assign the power or the flexibility portions to the single energy management systems until I'm not able to assign uh, more flexibility. So what we see is that there's a small downside of that uh, approach that it takes a while to uh, see whether a uh, overall flexibility profile is feasible or not, because we first need to assign the overall flexibility, and then we might get the result, okay, it's infeasible, so restart again. <clears throat> right. Comparing the different uh, assignment policies, uh, we can here see this huge figure. So we have here the equal share uh, policy, we have a proportional share policy, we have the cost optimization and the probability optimal. The policy. The uh, upper graphs with the blue color always show the cost, so the aggregated cost for providing the flexibility of the pool. The lower one uh, always shows the probability for providing the flexibility. And each uh, graph needs to be uh, seen like that. So on the y-axis, we have a flexibility request, so the, the power flexibility request in a kilowatt. And the uh, x-axis is the time horizon. So we start here as an example with time uh, 10. And we need to understand it like that. Uh, if we have a look at the point here, we assume that we will provide 500 kilowatt positive flexibility over a time horizon between 10 to 12. And the value that we get here in our circles is basically the result of the metric, so aggregated cost and probability. What you see here is uh, that if we optimize for cost, then we can provide this 500 uh, kilowatt uh, for two hours with yeah, more or less zero cost. However, the probability here is also very low or near to zero. So it seems like that some energy management systems that might produce uh, or can provide flexibility with a low or minimum cost that go very near to their boundaries, which in turn, uh, results in a very low probability for the overall delivery. If we optimize for the probability that we can get a high probability for delivery of the flexibility, we see that it is not always an optimal total cost. And um, what also very interesting to see is that from the shape of the flexibility provision, we see that it doesn't really matter much what disaggregation policy I choose, the overall uh, flexibility pool is always 
providing a more or less similar uh, capability of flexibility. The only thing what differs is mainly in the interior region, the cost and the probability of the system. Um, what we see here uh, is the probability also, the, sorry, proportional disaggregation uh, also provides a very good probability for delivery. That is, uh, in, uh, in fact, due to the case that for our simulations, uh, the 150 energy management systems that we've used for that uh, senior setup, they have a very similar uh, cumulative distribution function for the forecast error. So in case we will have a more uh, heterogeneous setup of forecast models in the different households, because it doesn't need to be the exactly same uh, kind of model or type, uh, we would expect that the proportional uh, disaggregation uh, will also have less good uh, effect on the probability. Right, so to finalize uh, my presentation today, I want to conclude. So what we have seen is that we have an efficient solution uh, with the mixed integer linear problem to solve uh, the local energy management system optimization, and we can do it in a decentralized manner. We have also seen that forecast errors uh, coming from local PV or from load uh, have definitely an impact on the optimization. And it is actually very interesting to consider the local forecast models also for the distributed uh, flexibility provision. The most important thing is that cost optimal flexibility disaggregation, like it is typically uh, provide, uh, proposed in literature, is not necessarily the best choice when we have a distributed set of energy management systems that rely on forecast models. Future work uh, includes a more uh, advanced way of uh, disaggregating the flexibility. So we are currently in uh, evaluating a multi-objective genetic algorithm to assign flexibilities to the different energy management systems. And this uh, approach will also consider uh, optimization of power grid losses, because we also always should consider with the grid. Uh, it will also uh, optimize for cost and probability, as we have seen today. And <clears throat> uh, we also want to have a look at fairness. So here the idea basically is uh, that if uh, we are not disaggregating the flexibility kind of fair among the participating energy management systems, we might face the problem that people that always need to provide flexibility, and even though they probably don't like to, or people that are simply ignored in most of the cases, they probably will uh, skip or uh, will um, um, exit such a flexibility pool. And then actually our overall flexibility uh, potential will decrease a lot, which we also want to avoid. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dominic. Very super interesting. Um, we already had a few questions in the uh, Slack channel. I can read them out, but if the if the uh, questioners are present and want to ask it in person, I think that makes more sense. So maybe Zonia, if you want to go first. Hi, Dominic. Yeah, I'm as you know, I'm always interested in the user. Um, oh, here the thunderstorm is coming along. Um, I'm always interested in the user, and on the one hand, I'm asking myself what happens if if something goes wrong. So is the user just your error? And um, also with regards to cost optimization, um, we know that people are not always 100% flexible, so that elasticity, um, consumption elasticity is not as high as you would expect. Do you account for this? And finally, I have a setting question. Is the battery only charged by the PVs or is it also charged and recharged by the grid depending on the prices? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the uh, user is mm, first of all part of, so if you consider the non-controllable uh, loads, uh, then it's part of the forecasted load uh, profiles. So it's partially the error, as you said. Um, and uh, for the um, Local optimization, we have uh, restricted uh, to uh, the, the German legislation that you kind of, um, uh, you're only allowed to use the, the battery storage system for your own uh, surplus power. Um, uh, but for flexibility for the later experiment, we have uh, removed that constraint uh, because it actually re reduces or limits the capability of such a flexibility a lot, a pool a lot. Uh, I can actually show here a small picture which is actually the uh, flexibility pool that we have just seen before. 
And uh, the yeah, optimized grip profile is plotted here. And we see the flexibility area in gray limited with the EMS constraint that uh, you can only use the battery with your local PV system. And if we release that constraint, we see that uh, the flexibility is much, much bigger. And actually it is getting even a bit more symmetric so that we get uh, positive and negative flexibility in a similar manner. Okay, thanks. Nice work, Dominic. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, we also had a question from Jonas. Jonas, do you want to ask it? Uh, yes, let me just make sure that you can see me. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, Dominic, first of all, excellent presentation. Really, really awesome to, 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 to listen through all of these interesting findings. Um, my question is more about where, what is the sort of situation with regards to where the devices are situated? So you've mentioned that during your experiments you had 150 EMSs. So are all of these devices within a local energy community or at least within a, the same DSO system operator? Uh, what is the configuration that you're using in your experiments? So for this paper, we have uh, kind of uh, assumed that we kind of abstract from the grid level. Uh, so we can assume that it is kind of, they are kind of connected with such a flexibility pool like with an energy community. Uh, but for the future work that I've mentioned uh, with the uh, multi-objective genetic algorithm, we are really considering the grid uh, layout as well. So we are planning, or we actually have already some initial simulations on low voltage, medium voltage network, where we kind of distribute the energy management system on the same uh, distribution system operator, where we kind of can then also consider uh, power grid losses in our disaggregation. Yeah, that, that information uh, really does give, uh, let's say, this uh, fine details that you can sort of tune and extract additional efficiency. This is really awesome work. Um, uh, also, a sort of side question. Uh, in this work, you mostly worked with EVs and PVs. Have you tried to uh, add additional energy vectors or have you have any experience with additional energy vectors, for example, heating energy? Mm -hmm. So I had a first look, uh, a short look to uh, heat pumps, which are quite a new, new but very emerging and flexible uh, technology for heating. Uh, the issue is, uh, first of all, the controllability of heat pumps. Uh, so typically, it is not that easy to really shut down or control a, a heat pump uh, directly. Um, so it's, it's not that easy to include that in a uh, optimization problem uh, because you have a lot of, uh, you, you actually do not know exactly how it will react. Uh, it also depends on weather, uh, so, uh, outside temperature, but it's also a part of a plan to integrate it for future work a bit to see what other flexible devices uh, might uh, suit you. Uh, yeah, just a teaser. Uh, my presentation will cover that. So <laughs> exactly, I would have guessed. It. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Dominic. Awesome, awesome. Great, thanks very much. And Jonas's talk is not the next one, but the one after, as a as a double teaser. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we maybe have time for one more quick question, but I don't see any hands at the moment. Um, in any case, I have a couple as well, but I think I'll uh, put them in the Slack since we're running uh, basically right on time at the moment. Thanks, thanks again, Dominic. All right, so we'll move on.